This is the last section of Catching Cold. It's section five. It is audio clip six for the day. And this will take us to the end of today's story. Once again, we have Neil Schusterman starting with an illusion that's going to help inform us about what's coming up for the rest of the section. Fables tell of a tortoise who manages to beat a hare in a race. The hare started out in the lead, but he was so sure of his victory that he took a nap as he neared the finish line and slept while the tortoise slowly but surely took the gold. Of course, in reality, the hare was probably eaten by a pack of wolves. And that's why the tortoise won the race, because after all, nature is cruel. But it doesn't lessen the moral of the story. Slow and steady, and a really hard fang-proof shell wins the race. So here we see, even though our author Neil Schusterman's kind of having fun with it, it's still an illusion. And it's an illusion to a fairy tale or a fable that you might be familiar with. The tortoise and the hare, or the, the rabbit and the, the turtle, right? That idea that we've got that rabbit who could easily win the race, but kind of blows it off, doesn't try his best because he doesn't feel like he has to. And then, of course, the tortoise, the turtle, who's working hard consistently and manages to win. Um, but again, we see that little twist of, strange dark humor that pops up because this is a Neil Schusterman story. So it does make us kind of wonder, is Marty, who was described at the beginning as being very slow, as being last, is he our tortoise? Is he going to win this one? Uh, or is he going to end up like that rabbit who got eaten by a pack of wolves? So this illusion is really kind of there to push that uncertainty and to build that suspense for us. So let's continue with the reading. This was a lesson Marty always took to heart. He was always last. He was always behind. But in the end, Marty always reached his goal. And he had a tough enough shell to ignore the bites and pecks of others who would much rather see him fail. Marty waited with uncommon patience until July 4th, when at 8.40 in the evening, he heard a familiar tune piercing the twilight. He wasted no time. He started his stopwatch and ran into the street. The streets were deserted as everyone had gone to the lake to watch the fireworks that would be starting at any moment. It would be perfect. There would be no one to get in Marty's way. Instead of following the music as he usually did, he ran across the street through two backyards until he came out onto the other street. His neighborhood was like a maze, streets that wound back and forth. It was easy to get lost if you didn't know where you were going. There were only two entrances into Marty's subdivision. A vehicle moving at the breakneck speed of 60 miles per hour could wind through the streets from one entrance to another in exactly one minute and 45 seconds. By cutting through backyards, he got to the first entrance in 50 seconds sitting there on the sloped street with his sister's car. His sister had recently gotten her license and was forced, in spite of the utter embarrassment of it, to drive their mother's old Buick station wagon. Marty had promised her his dessert for three weeks if she would just park her car in this exact spot. Now, he pulled open the door, put the car in neutral, and moved away from it. It began to roll backward, where it hit a plastic trash bin resting in the gutter across the street. Marty had positioned that trash bin there and filled it with bricks so that it could stop the rolling car. It did the job. Now the station wagon was blocking off all traffic in and out of the neighborhood. As for the creamy coal truck, it had come in from the other entrance. It would try to get out this way in exactly 25 seconds, and when it couldn't, it would have to turn around to go out the way it came. Even as he ran from the station wagon, he could hear the truck drawing nearer. But he didn't wait for it, not here. He took off again, stumbling over a picket fence, then crossed through more backyards until he emerged on the other end of the subdivision. By now, the ice cream truck had tried to escape, but the station wagon would have blocked its path. It would be heading this way now. In fact... He could hear the music growing louder. He pulled out the spike strip, which he had hidden under a hedge, and rolled it out so that it spanned the entire width of the street. 
His timing was perfect because 10 seconds later, he saw with his own eyes for the first time in his life, the creamy coal truck. It had screeched around a quarter and was heading straight for him. Catch me if you dare, the sign said. Now the truck would be at his mercy. Marty stepped out of the way as it came crashing past, bringing an icy wind in its wake, and then it hit the spike strip. Boom! Boom! All four tires blew. The spike strip flew from the street, snagging in a hedge, and the truck lost control. It spun a full 360 before hitting a street lamp so hard it blew out its light. And there it sat with four flat tires. It was pure white with a shiny silver grill. Its front windows were dark so he couldn't see in. The music it always played had fallen silent and all Marty could hear was the engine in a menacing idol. Marty slowly approached it, ready to relish his victory. The solid steel gate of the service window was down, but as he drew near, it slowly began to rise, and fog spilled out the icy breath of the mechanical beast. Then, inside, someone began to sing in a deep, gravelly tone. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. The monkey thought twas all in fun. Pop goes the weasel. In the darkness of the truck, a figure came forward to the service window, a man. He was entirely bald, but had a bushy brown beard covered in frost. He wore a white and pink polka dot outfit, the official uniform of the creamy cold man. Well, 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 he said. A customer. I caught you fair and square. I want my ice cream. The man leaned on the window's ledge. It'll cost you, he said. Marty pulled out a dollar from his pocket and looked at the picture of the ice cream choices. I want a cosmic raspberry swirl bar now. The man reached his hand forward toward the dollar, but he didn't take it just yet. He hesitated. Then he said, are you offering me this money in exchange for my ice cream? Of course I am. The man smiled, his lips stretching so thin they disappeared between the hair of his mustache and beard. Well, then, the bargain is made. He took the dollar, then turned around, reached into his freezer, and produced an ice cream bar. He held it out to Marty. One cosmic raspberry swirl bar. Marty grabbed the bar, ripped off the paper, and took a bite. It was just as he suspected. The most marvelous, the most creamy, the most flavorful ice cream he had ever tasted. The sensation was so overwhelming, it took over all his senses. Bit by bite, he devoured the bar, and when it was gone, he licked the stick clean. Only after the last bit of ice cream had dissolved on his tongue did he notice that he wasn't standing where he had been standing before. He was still looking at the ice cream man, but now Marty was standing inside the truck, and the ice cream man was standing in the street. The man was smiling even wider than before. Wait a second, said Marty. How'd I get in here? The bargain has been made. Enjoy your ice cream. He bowed deeply to Marty, but it was more a mocking gesture than a respectful one. And when he rose from his bow, Marty realized that the man wasn't wearing the uniform anymore. He was wearing clothes that were too small on him. They were popping at the seams. A red shirt, white pants, with a red baseball cap covering his bald head. It looked like a little league uniform. It took 39 years for someone to catch me. Now I'm finally free. Then he began to back away. Hey, ice cream man, wait, you get back here. I demand to know what's going on. 
Oh, I'm not the ice cream man, he said, and pointed a long nailed finger at Marty. You are. And sure enough, when Marty looked down, he saw he was wearing a white uniform with pink polka dots. As for me, my name is James, said the man in the Little League outfit. But my friends call me Jim Jim. Then he turned and ran away. Marty's whole body suddenly felt as cold as the ice cream he just devoured. He tried to climb out of the service window, but the steel gate came crashing down and sealed the window shut. He went to the driver's door, but there was no handle to open it. Then he felt a strange rising sensation. It's the wheels, Marty thought. The wheels are healing themselves and filling with air. In his fear, Marty found himself hyperventilating and getting dizzy. So he slowed his breathing down, closed his eyes, and tried to face the reality of the situation. Fact, he had made a bargain with Jim Jim Jeffries for the ice cream in the truck. Fact, Jim Jim had been trapped in this freezing place for 39 years. Fact, Marty wasn't going anywhere. But that wasn't exactly true, was it? Yes, he was trapped in a cursed truck, but that didn't mean he couldn't go anywhere. The truth, truth was, he could go everywhere because even a cursed truck needs a driver. When Marty opened his eyes again, he felt much calmer. Calm enough to reach into the freezer and pull himself out another ice cream bar. The freezer was full of them. In fact, it seemed bottomless. Then he sat in the driver's seat, put his hands on the steering wheel, stepped on the accelerator, feeling the engine rev. He didn't know how to drive, but that hadn't stopped Jim Jim, had it? With frost forming in his hair, he grabbed the stick shift, threw the truck into gear, and peeled out. As he did, he heard the music begin to play, blasting out of the speaker on his roof. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. There were neighborhoods to visit, hundreds of them. And there were thousands of kids to roust out of the warmth of their homes, all clutching dollar bills and spare change, running through the streets in search of an ice cream man that they'd never catch. Just the thought of it made Marty floor the accelerator, and he let loose a wild cackling laugh, because for the first time in his life, Marty Zybeck was fast. The end. So... Before we jump into questions, it's definitely worth going back to this section because this is where the bulk of your plot map lives, is in this section. And no, I know you haven't been asked to create a plot map, but it really does help to think in terms of the plot map so that we catch all the good details that we need as we go through a story. So right now, again, we start off with some character development. We've got Marty being very patient, very strategic. Uh, when the time does happen, he didn't waste any time. For the first time in his life, he's actually keeping to a schedule and he's keeping pace with things because he is that determined to execute his plan successfully. So at the point that we have all of this planning and planning going on, we're still in the rising action. The majority of this story is rising action to help build suspense. And that's what good writers will do. They'll elongate the rising action so that you feel like you really want to know what's going to happen. Okay? So as far as the actual climax, the, the turning point of the story, the point at which we have the most action drama where, you know, things never can go back for Marty after this part happens right here. It's when he catches that truck. He pops those tires. The truck is there on four flat tires. Marty wins. In this moment, he achieves his goal. But it doesn't change the conflict. The conflict, the problem, he still wanted to get to the ice cream. He's not there yet. So we still have a part of the story that has to play out. As we continue... And we have all of this dialogue between the ice cream man and Marty. That's where you've got your falling action. Things are starting to unravel. Marty's getting closer to achieving the goal of actually eating the ice cream. 
right? So this whole section where he, you know, decides he wants the, the bar and the guy hesitates with the money and says, are you sure? You know, you're positive. This is what you want. That's all falling action. And when we get to resolution is right here where Marty has eaten the ice cream. He's succeeded at the goal, but he's trapped now inside here. This is our resolution to our story because what it does is it solves the problem. Marty wanted ice cream. Marty's got ice cream. He's got ice cream for years. He has as much ice cream as he could possibly eat. That's all he's got, right? So it solves our conflict. But at the same time, what it does is it spins our story into an interesting new direction. So what Neil Schusterman does that I personally love is he leaves you wanting more. He leaves you wondering what happened next. And he does that with his full length novels like Full Tilt or Unwind or Ever Lost. Um, and he certainly does it here with his short story, because even though we are at the end of the story, we're, we're out of words. Right. And we see that Marty feels good about things because he's fast. We never really know, know what happens to him. You know, do his parents miss him? Does his father investigate his kidnapping? Does, you know, does somebody else catch him eventually? And if so, how old is he when he ha that happens? It just floods your mind with so many questions at the end. And that's what good writing will do for you. So with that, I'm going to end this file. And if you need help walking through the questions, then you can 